So hello everyone and welcome to the Research Networking Day of CTM Festival 2024 edition. This is actually already the 25th edition of the festival, so I'm already thinking about it, oh my god, 25th year, and the Research Networking Day is actually a really important part of the festival since many years, so I'm so happy to be here and being able to host this afternoon. My name is Anita Yori, I'm a research associate at Berlin University of the Arts, and I'm also one of the curators of the festival's discourse program, so this is why I'm also here. And what is this Research Networking Day about? As you all know, and I think also the title of this event can tell you that it's really about research, doing a little bit of networking on research. So what people do all around the world and everyone is invited to be part of it, so including you who are here today. And actually I have to say that I am so happy to see that so many of you came on the last day of the festival in the middle of the day. And I'm also sorry about the little bit of delay, so be please try to be really important part of this discussion too we are having here and an active part of this discussion because uh, it's going to be super important also for the participants for the presenters to have a little bit of feedback to ask nice questions um, for your for their research because some of them are also in the beginning or in the first phase of their research so I think it's super important platform for them to be here and also present their ideas mm. What else is this Research Networking Day about? Uh, we are collaborating here with different partners, as you can see all the partners on this slide too. We have uh, this year and every year is, we have different partners and different collaborators. And this year we have Berlin University of the Arts, the Institute of Art, Gender, Nature and the, at the Basel Ac the Academy of Art and Design. We have the CPOP Transdisciplinary Research Center for Popular Music Cultures and Creative Economies of the Paderborn University. The Berlin-based network and project space trust. So we have diverse collaborators this year, not only universities, but we are so happy to have trust also on board this year. And if we are talking about shouting out thanks to different institutions, I would also like to thank to my wonderful colleagues. And without them, we wouldn't be here today. So first of all, I'd like to thank to Ty Plensky, who was also part of the selection process, um, selection process of those speakers who are going to present their ideas today because you also have to know that the research networking day is always based on a call for papers so it's one of those few things for example with the hack lab together and with the radio program uh, that we um, write a little bit of short description of the festival which this year the topic is ob obviously sustain and then people apply for that mostly in the end of summer and early autumn and uh, last year I have to say we had more than 100 applications so also thanks to those of you who applied but can't be here today or you were not selected the demand is getting higher and higher so I'm really happy that this short little symposium we are having the research networking day is getting bigger and bigger so eight people were selected and as mentioned, Taisa was one of the other persons who was part of the selection process, alongside also with Jan Wolf, one of our directors, who I also like to thank his support also for the Research Networking Day. And of course, Valeri Baudo, who is also here and helping us with the whole um, process today, what we are having here and the management of the project. So Valeri, also thank you so much for helping us all the way here. And my role here is also to introduce the topic of sustain. And on my bike, actually it's an important part when we are talking about sustain, on my bike here I was really thinking about what to say about sustain when I'm coming here and, and especially what to say about sustain on the last day of a festival, on the 10th day of the festival. And um, when I think about it, that what sustain comes up into my mind when I think about this term I can talk here maybe two hours long, but um, I would rather try to give you a quick overview of the questions which, we were, which were raised by the festival in the last 10 days and are going to be also raised this afternoon, I think, in form of further discussions. So I think many of you have already read the theme of the festival, so I just picked out a couple of questions which I, I think are going to be super important for us in this afternoon also in the different topics and in the different modules of uh, Research Networking Day. So what if sustain were a sound? What would it be like? How can music scenes and practices be less extractive ecologically, culturally and socially? 
How can music ecosystems provide space for a divergent and independent communities to cross-pollinate and thrive in a climate of growing di uh, divisions? What will en enable DIY initiatives and attitudes to blossom, particularly in an unstable economy and in places without access to space? What frameworks and codes are needed to balance the give and take? And who is doing the giving and taking? How do, how do we build scenes where we all work together, growing stronger by creating pathways and access? So all these questions, are, I think, are going to be super important for us. And as mentioned, I don't have a, a specific answer to you what sustain really means. And I think everyone in this room has a different connotation and a different association about this term and about this notion of sustain. Um, and with these words, I would like to now officially really open the Research Networking Day and this afternoon and talk a little bit about the structure, what you are going to hear and what you are going to listen to um, in the next couple of hours. Mm, we have three modules, um, as you could see it on, in the program, and all three modules are hosted by uh, different hosts, which who I am also going to introduce later on. But the first uh, module, unfortunately, is not going to be uh, hosted by Christoph Jacke, so the sounding AI, which is just coming up in a few minutes. Instead, I'm going to talk it over because Christoph Jacke couldn't make it to Berlin because of the actual, not really sustainable situation of the Deutsche Bahn in Germany. So he couldn't make it to Berlin. This is why I'm going to take it over. The second session is um, entitled Embodied Listening, which is going to be hosted hosted by Jovana Maxic uh, from Trust, of course. Uh, we are really happy that Trust is on board, as mentioned. The third uh, last uh, session is t entitled Locating Sounds, which is going to be hosted by Stas Sherifula from Basel Academy of Art and Design. So how is the structure of those different uh, sessions? Um, first, I'm going to, or the different hosts are going to introduce the um, presenters, and then the presenters will have about 10 minutes uh, to present their topics. Then we will have a very, very short, like let's say five minutes Q&A between the host and uh, the presenter, which is going to be the same for the second and the third person within a one uh, session. And then all together we will sit on stage and we will have general questions, which is going to be open to all of you. So please keep in mind, if you have questions, please try to make notes because you will also have space and time later on to raise your questions. So now I'd like to move directly to the first session entitled Sounding Art, which is, um, as mentioned, I'm going to host in the end this, instead of Christoph Jacke. In this module, you will be able to hear insights of three excellent researchers, findings on alternative ways of compute, computation and critical AI. Matthias Jung will talk about symbiosis after Lin Magulis' ideas of how it can be implemented in coding music, for example. Then Ada 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 will talk about uh, AI-based voice cloning tools and how they create cultures of the paralinguistic. Super interesting. And last but not least, Aileen Zara will, similarly to other actually, will talk, also talk about AI-generated voices, but she will take a closer look at their expanded potentials of what the human voice and experience can sound like. So the potentialities of those AI-generated voices. So Matthias, I would like to ask you to come on stage. Um, I will introduce you in the meanwhile. Uh, Matthias is a PhD candidate at the University of Agder Christiansen, Norway, and as I heard you from last uh, yesterday that you handed in your PhD, so we fingers crossed also for the next phase. This is going to be now the, the phase when you can just lay back and also present your ideas here. So he holds a bachelor from uh, Paderborn University in Popular Music and Media and a Master's in Electronic Media from Stuttgart Media University. Before starting his PhD in Norway, he worked at Berlin State Academy as audio production specialist and headed the program team of Most Wanted Music Conference. As, and his research focuses on intelligent music performance system, bio-inspired coding, and creative symbiosis. And Matthias' presentation title is Symbiosis as a Sustainable Paradigm for Computational Creativity, or the title says a lot, and uh, I'm really curious to hear your insights. So, Matthias, stage is yours.
There it is, yeah. Thanks, Anita, for the nice in introduction. Yeah, um, my name is Matthias. I have been uh, studying the PhD for the last three years in uh, a town called Kristiansand in southern Norway at the University of uh, Agder, it's called. Um, and I'm just finishing up these, uh, these months. And my research has been mainly about participatory concerts. So we have been looking into how audiences can actually participate in, in shows, in our case, uh, mainly chiptune music shows. And along that way, I kind of, uh, came across uh, different ways to, to involve audiences and uh, with the use of AI. Um, and I kind of stumbled across this fact that mainly in real time, performance interactions with uh, audience participation, we mainly use uh, genetic algorithms. And genetic algorithms is such like a concept from the 70s, or it has been implemented in the 70s. Um, and that, uh, that's what brings me to this, to this title, Symbiosis as a Sustainable Paradigm for Computational Creativity. And I, I set this question mark because I'm in the middle of developing this or thinking about this. So I'm far from finished in this topic, um, uh, and I'm very much looking forward to also discussing it with you and the audience afterwards, including your thoughts to kind of develop the systems and yeah, make it the best system or the, the most inclusive one possible. Yeah, but let's look at the citation. A couple of years back in 2019, Fraunhofer said or suggested that our relationships to virtual realities Artificial intelligence, neuro implants are pervasive. Cyberphysical systems generate ontological uncertainties, epistemological diffusion, and ethical conundrums that require us to consider evolving the current research paradigm. And I think this is still true uh, four years later. Uh, I think we have to, to do a lot uh, through the background of the waves of human computer interaction, which I hear. Um, summarized for you using uh, Pedro, a uh, colleague's wor work, Pedro Lopez. Uh, someone is nodding, maybe there's some connections to him who has worked in this field. Um, yeah, the, the um, mainframe PC and also mobile paradigms in, uh, in computing um, mainly limit the, um, the amount of users and machines uh, being, um, uh, being able to speak to each other or interact with each other, whereas ubiqu ubiquitous computing has been described as remove that boundary in the sense that it's a many-to-many -many paradigm and the um, wave we are basically riding right now is the integrated wave uh, where these boundaries between humans and machines are also blurring. Um, coming to the interfaces, that kind of means that the mobile paradigm where users and uh, machines are disconnected, are already kind of more entangled in the variable par paradigm, and um, now are kind of integrated in our, into our bodies. And Lopez also suggested that um, the integrated paradigm is kind of preferable to the, one, to the implanted paradigm, where um, technology kind of implanted into our bodies because music, for the, for the field of music, we, it's still a very tactile um, practice that we have. So uh, it might not be the most preferable way, even if it has been suggested. So here, to make it a little bit more visible or a bit more tangible, I, uh, I can show you some photos from the lab I have been in uh, uh, one of the last semesters. Uh, I've been visiting uh, Georgia Tech's uh, music um, and robotic mu musicianships, uh, uh, robotic musicianship lab uh, in one of the last semesters, and uh, this really comes true here. Looking at, for example, Jason, who has this uh, robotic glove which is connected to his muscle, um, that kind of creates a different uh, form of human-computer relationship instead of. Um, human-computer interaction, you might say, because also the emotional realm comes into play uh, when we're communicating with uh, these entities. And uh, Lubart has suggested this um, as soon as 2005 when he was talking about machine companionship roles. So he's, he is talking about 
the, the machine as a colleague, as a friend, as, a, as different kind of more anthroposophic um, roles, you might say, but it's also like some times ago. And um, then I also wanted to cite um, the work for the field of music done by Eigenfeld et al, who said that the agency, uh, when the, um, is kind of decreased, the creative agency is decreased um, at, the, uh, at the side of the artist, whereas the, uh, the agency of the machine is kind of rising and this also already points into uh, the direction of a symbiotic system or a back and forth kind of mechanism that ends up at also different roles, so collaborative roles rather. Um, yeah, but what actually is at play when we are talking about these machine, computer, human interactions, uh, what is actually the coding behind it? And um, I found out that it's, it's basically, or in my view, it's like two big uh, paradigms at play. Of course, it's ANNs, neural networks in all their forms, um, which are based on training or learning paradigms. So we put a lot of data to them. They learn from the data and um, are trained systems, but they're not so much looking for things when we are using them for musical performance systems. We want to, to have fast systems that are looking for certain things. They might be trained on data, but we also need them to work in real time because music is a time-based, very direct, in the moment kind of thing. And that way, uh, that's where the gener uh, generative, uh, genetic algorithms uh, come in, which is a search-based optimization uh, algorithm, basically, developed in the, in the 70s. Uh, but they have a number of, um, of limitations. So just to get you through very quickly what, what is a genetic algorithm, um, we usually start with an init initial population, which is then selected based on various principles. Could be like a melody, or harmony, timbre, any musical feature really. Um, and then they're kind of crossed over with different individuals um, which are then mutated um, and evaluated. Usually that's where the human part comes in. So the audience might, let's say, evaluate certain musical features which are then calculated the fitness of and then they're fed, fed back into the selection kind of circle, and that, that's done many times. Um, and that's how kind of the musical collaboration kind of evolves over time. However, they are based on individual principles, so it, it's always like one melody, one feature, it's kind of a select, it's, it's uh, yeah, an individual paradigm, so to say. And they're based on Darwin, uh, Darwin's idea of uh, uh, selection of the most adapted individuals, or survival of the fittest, as you might also say. As a quite old principle that has been reworked, so to say, or supplemented by other principles, such as um, the work of Margulis in, in the also 60s, mainly, I would say, uh, who, has proved, uh, who has proven that um, biological systems or foundations, bodies, life has evolved through symbiosis, not only through selection. So what kind of symbiosis, what forms can we find in nature? There's parasitism, basically three, mutualism uh, and commensalism. Um, I'm not gonna talk too much about them, but parasitism is the one where one uh, species feeds off another one. Mutualism is like a back and forth, so you might know about the, the fungi tree, plant fungi relationships that comes uh, up quite quickly. That's a mutual a symbiosis. And the last one is commensalism. That would be um, when two species, uh, let's say uh, animal species, would collect food and then share it afterwards among them themselves. Um, whereas symbiogenesis would be the um, more evolutionary look at uh, the symbiosis and what it did to our evolution along the way. Um, for example, our, our cell 
in a human body is a merger between a bacteria and, uh, and that's uh, also like a symbiotic principle applied to, to evolution. So it's more like a longer term view, whereas like in certain forms of algae, there's also the, uh, the possibility that these rhythms are done quite quickly. So they, they would genetically alter like in just a couple of hours or maybe days. I've been talking to some of the biological researchers in our labs in, uh, in Norway. There's a quite a lot of marine biology and we're also trying to, to figure that out. Um, yeah, that's where I um, uh, thought about the, the different forms of symbiosis. So they are, they are there in many forms. They're in, in plants, they're in animals, they're in fungi, and then at the, at the intersections they're happening, of course. But then I wanted to open up this realm of thinking. Uh, what about technology, uh, humans and the planet and the symbiosis between these entities? So basically, I was thinking maybe that could be helpful for our discussion that what it, does it actually mean uh, a symbiosis between technology and humans or animals and fungi? So maybe that opens up a bit the thinking here. Maybe we can use that. Um, later on, but I just thought it could be interesting to to kickstart some discussions. Um, some of the pr approaches, I just wanted to point to what I'm working on um, these days. It's uh, some of the uh, these cellular interactions in development. They have been theorized also mathematically. I'm not a mathematician, but it's interesting thoughts in there. There has been a thing called uh, symbiotic organism search that has been applied to design, visual design. So I, I will try to look at it uh, from a more music, uh, musical perspective. And also planetary models or models of the environment um, that have been around um, might be very interesting to, to look at symbiosis on a, on a plan planetary realm, so to say. Yeah, I think I'm going to cu cut this one short. Here are some suggestions for applying this to the field of audience participation. But I, yeah, I don't want to limit us to this, but basically here I use the metaphor of the eukaryotic cell and apply it to um, audience participation. Um, and I'm using a, a measure that I developed. It's, it's called quantity of participation, which is a way to to kind of quantify and use the log data from the audience and the performers um, in, that, in that way. Okay, so the next steps um, would be an implementation of such a system, which I, I will try to do in the next months. Um, yeah, also theorize symbiosis as a principle of support and sustainability in the first place as such a co-evolving system rather than a, a selecting one. And finally, um, given that the ontological inseparability that we find in life um, arg uh, also argue for a thing I call symbiotic intelligence. And I'm happy to discuss this with you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Matthias. Yeah, feel free to take a seat. Here's the microphone, yeah. Um, also during your presentation and also when I read your abstract, I was always thinking about um, the role of embodiment and maybe it's going to be more like the, the second um, panel's uh, duty to, to answer these questions, but I was always thinking about this. Um, what is the role of embodiment in the symbiosis between the human body and the computer uh, by coding? That is because I think that this question is kind of valid in a way because uh, our body is, co in a, is a collaboration with countless symbiotics. So, so maybe because you use this metaphor, I think the, the embodiment part is, could be also an interesting, or did you do any research on that or was it part of your research? Is it part of it? Um, embodiment, like I, as a principle, I was um, using a little bit of uh, Lehmann's theories from 2008. Um, 
So I had this book. It's it's one of my favorite books still. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> you can later. name it for them. Oh yeah, a uh, lema. Uh, probably you know, like it's. Um, I, I don't think I get the full title together, but it's uh, embodied music college. I have to I have to look it up. I don't I don't get it. It's um, by Mark Lehmann from 2008, and he's basically applying uh, embodiment to the field of music. Um, and uh, the most interesting interesting parts in that book, I feel, is also about contagion and attuning and like the ways we kind of something um, emerges um, when we come together. Like it's more than the. Uh, the sum of the parts, so to say, and we we have this in music we, we say like musical emergence, and it's it, it's kind of under research. I don't know what you think, but I think it's very interesting uh, interesting effect because it's not really explainable like in scientific terms. It's some some people like or if you talk to performers, they would maybe say. Uh, the the audience or the atmosphere is always like more than fifty percent of the show. But what is it actually? What is the, uh, that ambience or that atmosphere or that vibe, that magic? Uh, it's hard to quantify it. I mean, I tried it a little bit um, in my research when people kind of uh, contributed musically, and that also gives us an idea of how how people feel or how, how active people are. And of course, you also have to do interviews and talk to them. It's not only the quantitative data, but I think it can show us like how much involvement is there and how much, what is actually happening. And, and technology in that way kind of gives us a more, much more refined um, understanding of that. It's much more differentiated than just the applause or like some kind of, uh, attuned voices or singing along. Um, I feel like it's also nice for performers to have a little bit more differentiated view of what actually happens in the audience. And we have the technology, it's just like sometimes hard with their bandwidth on stage, you're like in your show and you're, you're playing and it's already too much to look at a second screen and maybe check what, what individual audience members are doing. But I still feel it's, it's an interesting kind of way into understanding and collaborating with, with live audiences mm -hmm. as a performer. And maybe yeah. another question when you're using these biological metaphors like symbiosis for like computing and bringing it into the, the whole field of computation. Um, I was always thinking about because I don't have any computational background. So like, sorry for my naive uh, questions. I have a background in, in humanities, so it's, it's, you know, like language and uh, linguistics and, and social linguistics, so it's a different uh, era, but I was overthinking about the terminology, like using biological terminologies here, and are they uh, really useful, let's say, or are, are there any shortcomings of those um, terminologies to be used for computation, because I had to think of rhizome, which was really used in the, in the oh, yeah. 90s, and then we all know that it then ended up for the World Wide Web in a way that it's not used anymore and it, it had huge shortcomings because then it turned out that it's not a rhizome anymore. So now we're thinking about like bigger companies like Google and so on could use these, these biological terms also for their marketing departments and so on. So um, did you have any encounters with these shortcomings of, of using these terms, like biological terms? Yeah, I'm, I'm not so sure. I mean, for me, like, um, evolutionary coding should kind of include symbiotic coding, so to say. But I haven't found much on symbiotic coding. That is why I was digging a little bit deeper into it. And even if you might say, okay, it's kind of enclosing it already, it's evol evolutionary coding. Or even if you think about uh, genetic coding in the sense that you use algorithms for um, coding genetics, uh, that could also be understood. It's already including the symbiotic thing because it's also a part of it. But I found if we kind of focus on the symbi on the term symbiosis, it kind of kind of uh, triggers a different approach to 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 coding, or it puts us in a different mindset. And I feel in that regard, it's kind of helpful 
to to think that it's it's not the individuals it's not reproducing the the neurons of a brain of an individual brain it's it's already spread it's already a merger in the first place and having that present all the time while you're doing or developing a program or a composition or participatory work i think that is kind of where where the terminology actually is helping us rather than it's and and in that regard you might say it's it's kind of a shortcoming in the discourse of ai coding so to say oh that would be my argument but um yeah, I'm very happy to hear what what the others say about that. <laughs> we will see later on in yeah. the Q&A. Maybe the audience would like to add to that. Thank you so much, Matthias. Yeah, so thanks. Let's move on to the next presentation. <laughs> so our next presenter is Ada. Ada, 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 feel free to come up uh, on stage in the meanwhile. Um, Ada is an uh, algorithmic artist and research assistant at the IT University of Copenhagen. And she works with gender and bodies as perceived by computers through algorithms, software, and so-called artificial intelligence. Her own trans experience often comes into play in her works, and I think you will also hear that today, as being part of the research project, Voice as a Matter of Design at the IT University of Copenhagen, she discovers novel ways of using AI voice, again, AI voice, uh, cloning software. So, other stage is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so let's get this presentation up there. So, just have to check one more thing. Nope. Uh, wait. It's always when you want to do sound in a presentation, it's a little bit of an extra step. Um, I can't really see the window that opened before. Can you maybe just get the thing back? Yes, thanks. Okay, all right, let's try this. Cool, okay, so, um, yes, my presentation is called Cultures of the Paralinguistic in AI Voice Cloning Tools. So, without further ado, let's get into it. My name, as you've heard so many times, is Ada, Ada, Ada. You can just call me Ada. Um, my pronouns are she, her, or they, them. It's totally up to you which one you want to choose. I'm an independent algorithmic artist. Um, and I'm also a research assistant at the Voices a Matter of Design project. Um, and yeah, I work with gender, queerness, and bodies as perceived by algorithms, software, and artificial intelligence. Um, I have like a quite a broad view of queerness. So queer bodies is more the strange bodies, the uh, not allowed bodies. Um, and we will get into some of that in this presentation. So the main research question that I want to contemplate today is what happens when voice design becomes a matter of statistical analysis and averaging? So what happens when voice design becomes AI-based, pretty much? So before we can sort of get to that question, we have to just talk a little bit about what is AI voice cloning even, so we're all on the same page. Um, basically, the way that I see it, there's two main types. There's text-to-speech, and then there's um, voice-to-voice. Uh, voice cloning. And then there are some hybrid forms uh, that I will get back to later. And um, text-to-speech is where you put in some text and then the algorithm magically generates some speech that sounds like the text that you wrote. Um, and then voice-to-voice is where you input an audio file and then it sort of gets transformed into sounding like the voice model that you're using. So in the field of like synthetic voices, like computer-generated voices, we used to do what you could call concatenative synthesis, which is where you sort of split a voice into tiny, tiny bits, and the bits got smaller and smaller as research passed uh, through you know, phases. And then you sort of try to put that together into uh, making a, an audio clip or a voice, um, voice sound. But now we do what I like to call statistical th synthesis, which is where you use statistical methods to synthesize voices. Um, and that's pretty much AI voice cloning, or AI voice, uh, synthetic voices. So 
in when we're talking about voice cloning, we used to require hours of data to like clone a voice, um, but now we just can kind of do it in minutes. So you can go to a website, you can upload a minute of Miley Cyrus's voice, and then you can get uh, a voice clone of her, supposedly. Um, and that's thanks to this process called pre-training and transfer learning, which is where you have like a base model um, that has been trained on a lot of data, and then you sort of transfer um, the new voice that you want to use onto that. But the thing is, um, when you do that, a voice clone kind of feels more like a voice collage, because it's, it's not just the single voice, it is another voice, and then you lay your voice on top of it. And um, there's multiple layers to this, especially when you move into the hybrid forms. And I'm very interested in the paralinguistics of this, and thinking of this as a voice collage, not a voice clone, um, has some paralinguistic implications. And some of you may be wondering, maybe not Anita, because you study linguistics, um, what is paralinguistics? So paralinguistics is concerned with how you say something rather than what you say. So not necessarily interested in the words themselves as they are written, but how they are sort of said, and pretty much everything in between as well. So para is like everything around the linguistics, really. And since we don't have too much time today, I'm only going to be looking at uh, one feature of paralinguistics, which is pacing. Um, and I'm only going to be looking at it in text-to-speech. We don't have time to talk about voice-to-voice, -voice, maybe in the Q&A after. So um, most text-to-speech systems, they have speed as an option. So they have like this little dial, and then you can say, I want it to be twice as fast, I want it to be twice as slow, or whatever. Um, and then you will get that sound file. So this goes for like Google and Microsoft and Amazon and pretty much all text-to-speech systems. Um, but in reality, this is barely any different from sort of changing the tempo of a sound file, just putting it into Audacity and just changing the tempo. Um, it's a little bit different, but it doesn't really feel like pacing because pacing is also about the rhythm in which you speak. It's about pauses and it's about the cadence that you sort of have in how you say the words. And so what we're seeing is that AI platforms, they try to do more than just have a speed slider um, because it's clearly not a good representation of what pacing feels like. And most of the platforms, they just sort of ask you to add meta text. So they say like, just add a little piece of XML, HTML looking code that says pause and then how long it should be. And some of them have features where you can add the pauses automatically. But to be honest, usually they're just like commas and then they add a pause or there's a hyphen and then they add a pause after that. So it's not really um, rocket science. But then there's this platform called Eleven Labs, which I'm fascinated by because it's one of the biggest voice cloning platforms out there. Um, they suggest something a little bit different in their documentation. So they <laughs> introduced this thing that I like to call pace prompting. So they have this sentence where they say, um, if you want you know, the text to be read slowly, just write it in the, in the, in the text itself. Um, so they have this sentence, I wish you were right, I truly do, but you're not, he said slowly. And then the idea is that if you add he said slowly, then the AI model should pick up on that. Um, so the assumption here is that the pre-trained model that we're working with contains some sort of statistical correlations between the spoken pacing and the textual content, which I think is a bit of a logical leap. Um, so I wanted to try it out. So I tried doing this kind of pace prompting with a standard voice called Bill, it's just one of 11 Labs' thousands of voices. Um, and this is where it gets interesting because we have to open a link. Okay, so, um, yes, I, so I just took basically what's in your documentation, um, and then I put that in, so let's listen to that. I wish you were right, I truly do, but you're not, he said slowly. Which I think isn't really that slow, <laughs> to be honest. Um, it's kind of like stressful to listen to, and it's kind of like accusing in its tone. Um, so what we're sort of seeing here is that there isn't that correlation that we were sort of promised that there would be between the pacing and the actual text. Um, so I want to try, well, what if you do it quickly instead of slowly? So let's try to listen to that. 
I wish you were right. I truly do, but you're not, he said quickly. Which I think is kind of the opposite of what I wanted. Um, now it's sort of more slow than when I asked it to do it slowly. Um, so we're still sort of seeing this lack of correlation between pacing and text. Um, and I think what's very interesting about this is that I, I didn't make my own examples. I literally just used the one that they suggest in their documentation. And I used one of their own voices. I didn't even clone my own voice. Um, and then uh, sometimes when you work with AI models, sometimes you have to think, make things very, very clearly. Um, so I wanted to see, well, what about if we say we need it very, very slowly? I wish you were right. I truly do. But you're not, he said very, very slowly. And I feel like finally we got something that actually matched the pacing that we sort of described in the prompt itself. But for some reason, the pitch also changed. So it got like very deep pitch, and it's still the same voice. It's still Bill. Um, so the pacing and the text correlates, but then there was a correlation that I did not ask for. Um, there was a pitch change correlation. And this might come from the pre-trained model. It might come from the Bill model. It's really hard to say. Um, I might be able to figure it out if I dig more into it, but I haven't had the time yet. So what I want to get at is that sort of AI creates cultures of the paralinguistic. And this idea of cultures of the paralinguistic is from Brandon LaBelle. Um, and it's this idea that like what is spoken in the world determines what is regarded as unspeakable. So what we get used to hearing, what kinds of sounds, what kinds of voices um, also makes the, the sounds we're not used to, the voices we're not used to, sort of are seen as unspeakable. Um, and in AI context, this means that what is statistically represented and what is statistically averageable gets to exist. And then that sort of has an effect on the types of voices and the types of sounds we get used to and what we expect. Um, and since AI text-to-speech relies heavily on text, it's in the name, um, it means that if you can't represent these things in text, it sort of becomes unspeakable. There's voices or sounds or ways of having paralinguistic features that we lose. Um, and I'm just only going to talk about English text here, but paralinguistic features are not very easily represented in English text. If you read a book, usually uh, authors will spend a, you know, a lot of characters, a lot of descriptions saying how you know, someone coughs, someone sneezes, someone laughs, someone sighs, someone breathes, someone sniffles. Um, so it's, it's really complicated to actually represent paralinguistic features. So, Finally, what I want to get at here is that if we want these text-to-speech models to sort of have um, better, more beautiful cultures of the AI paralinguistic, then we kind of have to change written language itself. And I'm not sure what that actually looks like, um, but I think it's worth you know trying to figure out how we can have more beautiful cultures of the AI paralinguistic. Thank you. choose one. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ada, for the wonderful presentation. Um, during your presentation, I was just thinking about it, that how did you become interested in this paralinguistic practices that you mentioned also, Brandon LaBelle is probably from his work, but also there must be some other motivations you might have behind it, specifically focusing on that. And when it comes to AI, I think it's a, a very interesting topic. Um, yeah, so it's it kind of happened by accident. Um, I applied for a job as a research assistant, and they were very interested in paralinguistics. So I got inspired by my two, um, the two professors that I work with, pretty much. Um, and then, you know, I was opened up into this world of paralinguistics last year, and and really could all, could see all the parallels to my artistic work. So I work a lot, as I said, with queer bodies, and so I'm very interested in like. Um, the types of dangerous bodies in, in, from a systematic point of view and from an algorithmic point of view, the stuff that is not really allowed to exist. And um, there's so much of that in AI voices. Like the AI voices we have now are so, they're so flat, they're so boring, they're mm -hmm. um, really not very interesting, I think. Um, but there's so much more we could do with them uh, if anyone had the motivation or the funds, I guess, mm -hmm. to do it. Um, and usually what seems to get cut out is sort of 
people with various disabilities, which is why I'm also very interested, for instance, in, um, in stuttering as a, as a paralinguistic feature. Um, yeah. Yeah, so mm -hmm. that's pretty much how I get into it. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm asking this question because I had then this major question in myself that does the machine need to master the imperfections of human speech in order to be perfect? Um, I guess I don't think there's a, any point in trying to achieve anything perfect. Mm -hmm. um, but we need to be very, what do you call it, wary of um, what we sort of, what we cut away in a way. Um, and I think, again, going back to stuttering, um, there is, when you clone, uh, clone a voice, then often you will see these recommendations for how you should do it properly. And one of the first things is that like, you shouldn't stutter and you should have like a uh, consistent voice or something like that. And which is just, you know, a, a literal way of, of sort of excluding people who have a stutter for whatever reason. Um, mm -hmm. They're not sort of allowed into this world, um, yeah. And what is cut out is also also very political. This yeah, way, exactly, and, and it's, it's especially it's, nowadays. Yeah, yeah. and it's uh, like having a having a stutter is it's so many different things, and I think I sort of have a personal relationship to it, not because I have a stutter or live with a stutter myself, but my dad um, had one when he was uh, when he was a kid, and he went to like training and 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 uh, classes to sort of get rid of it because that was sort of you, you can't have that because that society doesn't really want you to have that in a way. There was no patience for people with a stutter, I think. Um, and he sort of trained through it, and now he's a lawyer, and he does a lot of speaking in his, in his life, and that's you know, great, and it's sort of a success story, but at the same time, he still has that stutter sometimes, but it's as if I'm the only person who actually ever notices it. But for me, it's an important idea of like the vocal identity of my dad. So I wouldn't want him to sort of get rid of it. I think it's you know part of what makes him him. Um, yeah. A lot of identity politics. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you so much, Ada. We will be coming back to this uh, topic, I think, later on, because now we are having another presentation with a very similar topic, but with a different angle. So I think the two of you will be in a very nice conversation, hopefully, by the end in the Q&A. Thank you so much, Ada. Thank you. <laughs> So our next presenter is Aileen Zara, who is also, Aileen, feel free to come up on stage and in my, is a PhD student at the University of Toronto's Faculty of Information in Media, Technology and Culture, and is part of the Book History and Print Culture Collaborative Program too. She works as a researcher in the Canadian book industry with BookNet Canada and is a founder of a publisher of a Narrative Press, which is written N I N. Uh, capital A, capital I, Narrative Press. So I was also asking Eileen in the beginning how to pronounce it, but it's still narrative, even though AI is part of it. So it's a publishing house uh, devoted to AI written and AI narrated, narrated audio books. Her doctoral research uh, focuses on AI generated voices, orality, and storytelling in audio book narration. So I'm really looking forward to your presentation, Sustaining Voice, AI Generated Voices and the Human. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, thank you for all also being here on a Sunday. Uh, and thank you to CTM for having me. I have been having the most wonderful uh, week and a half with all of you at various events. Um, as was already mentioned, my name is Alin Zara. My pronouns are she, her. And I'm a PhD student at the University of Toronto in Canada. I live, study, and work in Toronto, which is the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and Wendat indigenous peoples. It is a treaty meeting place and now home to many indigenous, Métis, and Inuit, as well as settlers. Uh, today I'm gonna be talking about AI voices and the potential for disentangling conceptions of synthetic voices from the human voices they replicate towards a sustainability of both human and non-human voices. I've divided my talk into four sections. Um, 
the first section I've called Introducing, which we are almost finished doing. When we synthesize the human voice, so deconstructing it into those units and recombining them into magnetic tonalities and vocalities via neural networks for presumed perpetuity, how does this cloning succeed in its project to sustain ourselves? Whose or what memory is being remembered and sounded? What interpretations of AI-generated voices exist underneath this mimesis? And how and what is AI voicing? I propose to explore these questions through a recent research creation project. Uh, research creation is a core methodology that I'm engaging with in my PhD. It's a Canadian methodology, I mean, it's a Canadian term, but it's similar to arts-based research in that it's a creative practice. Uh, for scholars like Aaron Manning, Kim Sawchuk, or Owen Chapman, Research creation is an iterative process that isn't so concerned with the object that you're creating as much as it is a mode of activity that creates and processes forms of knowledge. This is to say that I'm using research creation as a creative experimentation in a process towards my final dissertation, but it doesn't necessarily mean that any of these works will be included in my dissertation. Uh, with this framing, I'm going to be sharing parts of a recent research creation project that serves to analyze and ask some of these critical questions about AI-generated voices. This is a project of sound making, asking AI to generate and voice quote unquote new sounds through wordplay. With shoestring budget and computational power, I developed this project in two steps. The first was in creating new sound words using chatbot Lama2 through Hugging Chat. My choice to engage with a chatbot for this project is part of a separate research project that situates AI prompting as its own research methodology. With a combination of workshopping and conversation, Lama2 and I talked about the symbolism of sounds and went back and forth exchanging onomatopoeia and other sound words to ultimately create nonsensical strings of letters that represent new, unheard sounds. More often than not, Lama II struggled with doing this. Putting nonsensical strings of letters together was hard for it to do correctly, and I was often given recognizable sound words instead. Yet I was asking it to do something I consider to be easy and relatively intuitive, at its fundamental, it's key smashing, um, or maybe something more akin to the way that a baby meaningfully combines sounds together as it learns to speak. Eventually, we developed these 24 words for sounds that have yet to be voiced into existence. I asked Lama Tu to define the sonic symbolism of each sound word it created, which was seemingly random. The second part of this project was to generate sounds from the sound words Lama 2 had developed. For this, I inputted each word into a beta AI sound effect generator, which generates text to sound. I generated three sounds for each word. The 10 second audio clips were distinct sound word to sound word and varied from music, to sound effect, field recording, and vocal track. What strikes me the most about these clips isn't so much their audio quality, which is pretty bad, but the way that the sounds exemplify the sonic symbolism Lama 2 predicted for each sound word, an observation that I recognize might just be rooted in my own bias. I showed the sound words, sounds, and symbolisms to a few friends and my doctoral supervisor, video artist Emmy Luca, to see how they interpreted the sounds. Could they match the sound words to the sound, or the sound to the sound symbolism? The general consensus was that the sound words and the sounds were less easy to associate, but that the sounds and sound symbolisms possessed a certain logic that made it possible for them to be linked together. I'll show, um, or I'll share actually two of these sounds with you today. Uh, so you get, that you get a better idea of what was created. So the first sound, S-D-F-H-J-E, 
uh, for Lama Chu is a sharp quality that evokes a sense of urgency, anxiety, or stress. Uh, the second sound is um, P N R F G. Oh, actually, the second sound. No, the second sound is this one. P N R F G H M. Um, P N R F G H M is a combination of high and low pitch sounds that evokes a sense of power or depth. So understanding the way that AI intentionally or unintentionally makes sense of language to produce an output is an emerging topic of study. In the realm of AI image generation, Gianna Stadis and Alexandro Stimakis have worked to interpret the logic behind Dali 2's vocabulary and the presumed nonsense words that appear in its images, showing that the gibberish is often related to the subject of the prompt. So the image on this slide shows two whales talking about food on the left and the food they're talking about on the right. The images on the right are generated from the words in the speech bubble on the left. Rafael Milliard has furthered this work through so-called macaronic prompting. Here, Dali's gibberish is less nonsense and more nonce, N-O-N-C-E, meaning a one-time word with no context or consistent semantic meaning. These words are made up of short tokens or pieces of words across languages of the same meaning that can be combined to make a prompt that is understandable almost only by AI. So the image on this slide shows a nonce word for bird, which is made up of tokens from German, Italian, French, and Spanish words for bird. For Catherine Behar, this use of macaronic prompting places these tokens in the in-between without replic replicable intelligibility, holding meaning that can't be pinned down or reproduced as a register of self-reflection between human and non-human understanding. So regardless of whether or not my little experiment holds, it poses important questions about the way in which AI generation systems make sense of sound and voice underneath the surface, processes which fundamentally govern what is voiced, what is heard, and what is understandable for both humans and non-humans. In doing so, it produces a vocality that is distinctly synthetic, beyond and in spite of its mimetic human quality. Following Jean Baudrillard and David Gunkel, AI-generated voices signify less as a copy of original human voices and more as a simulated hyper-real vocality, an expanded potential of what the human voice could sound like. For Dominic Petman, these extra-human voices demand a different kind of a presence through new relationships of listening. This perhaps brings us somewhere closer to the work of indigenous scholars, Jason Edward Lewis, Nolani Arista, Archer Pachawis, and Suzanne Kite in their 2018 essay, Making Kin with Machines, which examines a range of indigenous frameworks and protocols for being in relation with AI and creating mutually intelligible discourses across differences. Remaining vitally aware of the critical discourses of power, bias, labor, and ecological sustainability that surround the creation and maintenance of AI, positioning AI voices within human and non-human sustainability appears also to be a project of the in-between, the synthesized human voice, a memory that exists within computational imaginaries and sense-making towards a question of how we can recognize and understand one another among these voices. Um, so those are my 10 minutes uh, and the end of what I have written, but thank you for your time and I look forward to chatting with you about these ideas. Thank you so much, Aileen.
Thank you. Um, you also mentioned in your uh, presentation in the beginning that now we reach the point that it's very difficult to differentiate. It's still one can feel the difference between AI generated and let's say natural or human uh, voices. And in the future, I guess it's going to be even more um, that we can't differentiate between the two. And you also mentioned in the end of the presentation that uh, you interpret it as um, the difference between the two as a hypervocal reality. So what will be then in the future that, you know, when we don't have the difference anymore between the two, that how this expanded uh, layer and meaning what you also um, explore in your research will come in? Mm -hmm. Will it be possible? Um, a lot of my research, because I work in the publishing industry, a lot of my actual doctoral research is in audiobooks and the way the AI is entering into those spaces. And when scholars talk about audiobook narration, the embodied person is so important in that generation because it's why people listen to it. And so it's very interesting to now be having AI voices that are so disembodied and how can someone engage in an audiobook and really that experience that the person is talking when there's no body behind it. Um, but there, I saw, I think it was just last summer, the people from Google were at University of Toronto and they were presenting new work and they had, it's called audio LM, but the AI, you could hear the AI breathing and talking as, as if it was embodied. And so I think it'll become more and more difficult to differentiate, but also, um, as Ada was saying in her talk, um, there is something that is still very distinctly AI about it, and it's gonna be statistically a breathing that we can all, like a standardized breathing that we cannot recognize. So I think that we might end up coming up with kinds of like codes and methods for identifying it instead. Can you say a little bit more about this, this publishing activity? Because I found it really interesting in your bio that you work also at your own uh, publishing house. That What are you focusing on there about when it comes to aesthetics, for example, of the AI? Are you focusing on that? Or is it more like an experimental project? It's more of an experimental project. This, these sounds I'm going to actually be transforming into calling it an audio script for a play that someone could activate with these sounds. Um, it's just more of a place for me to put my research creation projects as I continue to kind of explore. And so at the end, it should be kind of a building up of ideas, the different things that I'm thinking about at the time in the way that AI can storytell or we can storytell with AI through sound. Amazing, looking forward to, yeah. to look into that. Yeah, thank you. I would like to ask now the others to also come on stage, Matthias and Ada. That would be great, and we can open up discussion to a bigger round. Can bring all of you together, and I think there were a lot of lot of um, correlations between your presentations and a lot of similar points, but at the same time also very different angles and. Um, Maybe I have just a very, very general question and I would like to warn now the audience to jump in anytime they would like to also raise their questions that, um, um, yeah, so my question would be, you all three, I, I would say, are very critical uh, with these technologies and also with AI and, and I think it's also we can agree on that in this this room or let's say at the CTM, in the CTM circles, this, this is general case, but we all know that the rest of the world, uh, let's say, is not how it is about when it comes to computation or when it comes to AI discourse or critical AI. You also discourse with that. that how do you see that now, the, how the discourse evolves also out of these little critical circles we are filter bubbled inside and then out of that, like let's say bigger companies of Silicon Valley uh, sees that probably in a different way. So how do you see that are there? Because of your own voices, because you do all these like critical researches, do you think that it will change or like there is a little tendency of change towards this criticality or you feel, still feel like that? It's not, not what is the reality. Should I go first? Yeah. Um, so I have a sort of strained relationship with the AI discourse, which is also why I sometimes put it in quotes, because I, I, some, sometimes I prefer to call it automated statistics. Um, but people just don't know what I'm talking about if I say that. So I just, yeah, I fall back to AI. Um, but I think we're definitely seeing like a lot of reactions and a lot of more mainstream people 
you know, trying to understand what the technology is, uh, what can it do when people are scared and people are excited and there's everything in between. Um, but I think what I'm, you know, kind of hopeful about and, and interested in following more is this sort of counter movement that sort of values craft and non-AI created stuff. And I think um, there was something that Aline said that made me sort of, yeah, so this, this idea that like, well, we will, might, we might have, we do already have AI generated breathing, but it's like a very particular kind of breathing. So maybe what we'll see in audiobooks is that, you know, the, the human narrators will sort of embrace the paralinguistic stuff more. So all the stuff that the AI can't do and that the AI companies maybe are not interested in doing. So maybe we will hear more coughing, more sneezing, more um, of that kind of stuff um, in audiobooks. And I think that's really exciting from my perspective as well, because I'm sort of interested in having these deep, wide, uh, inclusive, beautiful paralinguistic cultures. Um, so maybe AI in a sort of reverse way can sort of trigger this movement to, to, to broaden the paralinguistics. Uh, yeah, no, I, I was just thinking... Is this on? Yeah, okay. No, I was just thinking about virtual artists when you said uh, the critical discourse um, that we have and the public doesn't. I'm not sure if I can agree with um, looking at virtual artists because people are so critical about them, right? Or they have been, like, a couple of years back when there were studies uh, among audience, like general audiences, and they were very critical towards virtual artists um, because they didn't have the relation to them and they didn't have the emotional, like the shared human emotion um, that they expect when going to a show or a music concert or uh, maybe also listening to an audiobook, I don't know. Um, someone who is, is at the other side and experiencing the world with a body having feelings and sharing them on a stage or in an audiobook or wherever. And uh, I was really amazed by how, how critical people actually were and neglecting it even. So I think these products have to be looked more like holistically as, and I think the audience is also learning that. The, the more we talk about it, the more people understand what's actually happening, what it is actually. But I also feel like they're, they're kind of interesting potentials. I was just thinking about the, the bodily component when you're listening to an audiobook or a podcast and how could it interact with you actually? Like how could it you read your body signals to, to give you what you need in a, in a certain way and how could you interact with it? So I think that's also very interesting. And you, you guys know obviously much more about that than I do. <laughs> We, we had a couple of years ago a Hatsune Miku show. I don't know if you had the chance to see it, but that was really went in line with this, what you just mentioned, with twisting it a little bit around and then being critical with the, with the technology itself. Yeah, I was just also seeing, last year there was one scholar talking about unlearning, which I found also very interesting. Like, how do we actually untrain, detrain the systems that we, we created? in the sense that we also interact with it and yeah, um, not let it be there for forever in the, in the form that it is. I think Eileen and also Ada, both of you do that actually, and you're also in your artistic practice and then publishing. Yeah. Eileen, do you have anything yeah, else I to add? I think that um, the unlearning I think is really vital because there are so few companies that are able to create these models and the way that they create them can be so problematic ecologically, but also just in terms of their, the models that they're being trained on. Um, and all the biases and power relationships they're in. So I think that having, I think that as technology develops, it might become easier for people to do this work themselves in a way that's really critical. Um, that essay, Making Kin with Machines, which is about those indigenous frameworks for relating to AI, they talk about maybe what would it be to have an indigenous AI, like an indigenous created AI with indigenous, um, ontologies as its learning models and what would that would look like. But right now it's not really feasible to create something like that. So hopefully in the future, it's to double edge, sorry, the technology needs to develop enough that people can use it without needing billions of dollars to be able to make a model. Um, but hopefully we'll get to that point where we can really see some kind of critical intervention. 
Thank you. So I would like to open the floor to the audience. Is there any question? I can't really see you, but maybe is there anyone? Like to raise a question? Oh. Yeah, you, oh, okay, now Matthias, we, please. The minute you said yeah, that, we got please. two raised hands. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay, even better. So we have two questions there. Yeah. Thank you. Very interesting. My question is for Aline. Um, you mentioned the term sonic symbolism. Um, it's, it's like just a personal interest in it because I listened to a podcast by Björk uh, a couple of years ago. They did during lockdown. It's called Sonic Symbolism. I was always wondering. I could, maybe could have just looked it up, but I was, I was wondering, is it like a term, like a fixed term you use with a specific connotation? Is it a term you yourself put together to describe your work? Or what, long story short, what do you understand about sonic symbolism? So where's the symbolism in the sonic? Yeah. Um, it, is a term, it's, it is a term that exists, but it's a term that I use because it's the term that Lama too wanted to talk about. <laughs> Because we were talking about how sounds can have meanings and how we could put you know, words and letters together to make new sounds and would it like to do this with me? And then it said, oh, I know about sonic symbolisms. And then it started telling me about how sounds and how meanings that could have meanings together and that it could can kind of evoke a different effective presence. And so that's the context in which I use it, kind of guided by, um, guided by the chatbot, I guess. There is another qu question, yeah. I'm interested in the idea of performing imperfection to prove authenticity or humanity, which was, I think, something Ada said, or noted could be, right? You mean sort of in terms of how, uh, you know, all the, the the coughing and the sneezing yeah, and, yeah. and all that um, kind of stuff. That uh, type of pressure it could put on us to have a new type of self-consciousness to prove we're real or to revalue ourselves as imperfect is fascinating. Yeah, but I think it's it could, it could go a lot of ways, um, but I think there might also be... I, I'm just sort of out in the world seeing that there is there are a lot of people now thinking about, well, what actually makes us human? And it is maybe those imperfections and those things that our culture maybe doesn't really appreciate uh, right now. Um, you know, you're not allowed to fart, really. <laughs> like, it's that kind of stuff that, but everyone does it. Um, so maybe that's, you know, maybe it won't be such a taboo to uh, fart in the cinema in the future because we're sort of, um, embracing that stuff in a way. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's the first time I've said fart on stage. <laughs> now I did it three times. Yeah, there is a question. Thanks. Hi, um, I had a question for Ada also. Uh, I was, it's a tactical question, I was just wondering, you, you talked about these speech-to-speech uh, -speech AI voice models. And I just wondered the the question of the sort of flattening of the uh, the what did you call it the para para linguistic uh, breadth is it the same with these or does it pose different questions or yeah I really wish I could have had time to play some examples um, that was my original plan um, but uh, no so voice voice to voice tends to be better at doing that kind of stuff but it's also sort of a simpler transfer of um, of audio features in a way because it's it's from one audio clip to another another audio clip, um, but then sometimes you do get like these weird things. So I have I've tried to like record myself laughing uh, in different ways and then sort of did voice to voice transformation on that and um, it sounds like laughing but it also sounds not like laughing. <laughs> it sounds um, cybernetic in a very interesting way. Um, and I also did like an experiment where I found a, like an audio clip of uh, children stuttering. It was like made for an, uh, uh, 
a charity that supports people with a stutter. Um, and then I sort of took that and did voice to voice uh, cloning on that. And, and that actually very much felt like the same type of stutter that, um, that the children have in the original video. It was also kind of weird because it sort of transformed it into a, 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 something that sounds like an adult man's voice, which um, is also like an interesting thing that you can do. Um, but with text-to-speech, it's absolutely not possible. You can't even get close to something that sounds like uh, an actual stutter. Um, so yeah, voice-to-voice -voice definitely has a lot easier handling those, like embracing the paralinguistic cultures, but the applications for it are just so much more limited in a way. Like you can't do it for audiobooks because then you already have the recording of the person reading the audiobook and then you wouldn't need to do voice cloning on it. Um, and something I forgot to mention is, so those hybrid forms, I promised I would talk about them, but I forgot. Um, and in 11 Labs, I haven't been able to pinpoint if it's exactly how they do it, but as far as I can tell, when they do voice cloning in the text-to-speech realm, what they do is they generate text-to-speech first, and then they do voice transfer or voice-to-voice -voice cloning onto that. So um, you're sort of doing both things at the same time, which also gives this weird that you're sort of inheriting the, when you use their text-to-speech, you're also inheriting the limitations of voice-to-voice. -voice. So it's, it's also, yeah, I said there's two types, but there's not. It's a very fluid thing, really. Is there any other questions from the audience? If not, Matthias, you wanted to ask a question, or it has uh, been answered. I know, no, I was just uh, curious. I was just uh, thinking about choirs, like choir singing and voices, and how um, this might be uh, possible to to kind of um, generate interactions between the voices, like the generated voices. Uh, can you say something about that? Or like, let's say like um, a generated voice talking to another voice without a human in the loop, so to say, but then when the human in the loop enters, kind of what does it to, do to that conversation or to, the, or to that practice in the, in the sense of uh, choir singing or I don't know. I was just curious, really, um, if there's some kind of research or work on that. We've actually, we've actually done this. There you go. Um, we've actually done some research about choirs. Um, so there's another research assistant in my project. He sort of went the sort of synthesizer route and tried to like add effects and everything. And I tried to do it in the uh, AI route. And I, to be honest, I made like these. I made a terrible uh, fake choir in Audacity, um, but I trained a text-to-speech uh, model on that, and it turned out that like it was actually kind of capable of retaining that choir-like feel to it. So I had like a text-to-speech model that was also a choir. Um, so yeah, that's it's definitely possible. It's, it can be quite uh, interesting and beautiful because you have these multiple voices and. We also wrote a paper about how, you know, if you embrace multivocal AI voices, it's a big thing that we're interested in in our research project, um, then um, you might also be able to sort of build these kin networks between different identities and, and, and entities. Um, so, yeah, it's a really fascinating area and something I want to look much more into. Yeah, interesting, yeah. Could be nice to sing with a with an AI choir if you can make make it to go to one or something. I mean, that's also a very good experience to have, anyway. But you also said that thing about how, what if there's you know two AIs talking to each other, and have you ever seen that video of the Alexa and the Google Assistant talking to each other? Uh, not really, I think. Oh, okay, no. it's, I think it's like five or six years old by now, but you should look it up. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it it's, it yeah, <laughs> it's, it's kind of hilarious because they just end up going in a loop, but, yeah. Uh, yeah. and yeah, but. It doesn't make much sense. It's, it's rather more interesting to, uh, to have more, more of them doing something for, uh, for you and interacting with that group. And I was just wondering about the, the communities that can be created with, with these voices and, um, and and how they interact also uh, theoretically at the end of the day or how you kind of approach these uh, these strategies behind, behind them. 
But thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Ah, yeah. There is one more question from the audience uh, here in the front. The last one. Thank you. Hi. Hello. So um, I actually wanted to ask this while there's like three researchers working on AI, and I will try to like smash my toes into a question. Um, I feel like there is this paradigm, paradigms and also algorithms, and they are very much applicable to biology and evolution, to linguistics, and also, of course, computer science and computation. And therefore, I see it kind of um, AI like a branch of our own evolution rather than being like something so um, apart from it. And do you think um, is this is this the case for you? What will you what will your thoughts be on that? And and regarding that, do you think we are also kind of having a posthuman experience, or we are on the verge of maybe having a posthuman experience? Because I feel like we are already in a symbiotic relationship, as you said, with technology as humans. And yeah, do you think the outcome of this and the experiences we have is somehow could be post-human or going to that direction. Um, I mean, I would agree with that. I think that, um, I mean, at its basis, the AI project is exactly that, is to recreate the human mind um, as a computer. And I think if you listen to the way that the people in Silicon Valley talk about AI, a lot of them actually talk about philosophy of the mind, like they pull in philosophy in the way that the mind works is the way that they're trying to make AI work. And so I think that I would agree that it is very much a human project, which is why I find Matthias, your work so interesting to bring in the kind of evolutionary symbiotic thinking into AI, because it is a very, bio, and it's not a biological project, but it is a very human project in that I would agree that um, AI is very much an extension of the human. Yeah, absolutely. Like, um, I, I also think like when we talk about posthumanism, we can't forget about again embodiment, tactility, and especially in the realm of music, um, where I work, it's it's so critical to to have that layer of touching instruments. I mean, that's that's what music is. We we have a relationships to objects, even if they're not AI enhanced, right? So we they have a a meaning to us, uh, they give us feelings, we interact with them, we touch them, and that uh, certainly comes true for, for new uh, interfaces for musical expression as well. So I think when designing these systems, that's like a very important point to, to consider. And I think uh, yeah, in the systems that I'm trying to develop, I'm kind of also tending towards that realm of of also giving audience members uh, ways to interact uh, on a tactile level. So um, I'm creating these like small balls now, like pressure balls, stress balls, that kind of thing that also um, includes that, that realm of tactility. And uh, a lot of questions open up in, in that regard. Also, if you think about AI and tactility, and I think that's kind of also under research or underdeveloped. Uh, it's still very codey thing, AI these days, so I'm looking forward to seeing more real world um, haptics and tactile tech in the next years. I, I think it's a really interesting question. I, but to be honest, I don't think there's anything specific about AI that makes it more an extension of our, yeah, our human evolution. I think all technology development has has done that, whether you go all the way back to when we uh, discovered language or invented language or however you want to say it, uh, to the scissors, to, um, to computers, to uh, AI. I think it's, it's all sort of part of that evolution, but that's also because I'm a cyborg feminist. So um, yeah, um, but I think maybe uh, one thing that I think I try to always mention when I talk about AI is that um, it is a very resource intensive technology much more than than previous um, types of computation, and in a weird way that like if we think of AI as an extension of human society and human bodies, then uh, we also get entangled with 
planet Earth and uh, all the min minerals that we're pulling out of the ground and, and ecosystems that we're destroying. And, and we're doing that with our own bodies in a way, if you think of it like that. Um, and that's really important to, to also keep in mind. Is that worth, is that extension of our bodies worth it? I think it was a nice question in the end that we can also finish it there and uh, give this question to the audience to think about and then also linger a little bit around. So um, thank you so much, Matthias, Ada, and also Elan for being here and presenting your own research. We are back in 15 minutes at 2 p.m. We will follow up with the next session. So thank you so much also for being here and being active part of this uh, panel. See you then at 2 p.m. Thank you so much.